thank you for that, Henry. I wasn't looking to let everyone know that I do a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but the word is out now, and now I've got to watch my back. So when, when, people find out, when people find out that you do any martial art or whatever, they're like, hey, what would you do if I did this? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Let's do it. Should we find out? No. <laughs> um, man, guys, it is a, it's an honor any time that I get to do anything that is serving the Lord amongst God's people. I feel blessed and honored to be here um, and get getting to do this. And it excites me when I get to uh, walk out the calling that I know is on my life, that God has called us to be ministers of reconciliation. And that there's a freedom that comes when you come into Jesus that says you get to now have the authority to go and bring that same reconciliation, that same freedom that was given to you, given to me. I get to now come out and and walk that out and share with you the reconciliation that's happened in my life and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God's testimony, the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy and it prophesies his goodness. And if he did it for me, he can do it for all of us. Um, For those of you who don't know me, my name's Rob and I've been here for about two years now. My wife and I moved up here just a little over two years ago and we had felt just this strong call from the Lord, that our time in, we're living in Vancouver, Washington, and we just both, we came out of a church service together, and without even knowing what the Holy Spirit was doing, my wife looks at me, and she is like, I don't, I don't know what we're doing here anymore, and it wasn't like a bad thing. It was just like all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit started to work in our hearts of leading us up to here, and I was like, that is crazy. I had the same thought in church today of like, the word that I kept hearing is that our time is coming to an end. And we had always known that our time in Vancouver wasn't going to be forever. Um, And the Holy Spirit started to orchestrate us coming up here. And we've got family that lives up here. Um, I've got three nephews that live up here. I've got three girls as well, and they hang out all the time. And we had dreams of doing ministry together, and that's happening now. And the Lord just orchestrated something that, that we couldn't have done on our own. And speaking of orchestrating things, i got to share with you this, that Today, I want to be talking about the mind of Christ. And two weeks ago, I come to church and I hear Henry speak on the mind. He's talking about the helmet of salvation and spiritual warfare. And I texted him afterwards. I was like, Henry, that was amazing, man. Like, that goes, like, God's been putting on my heart the mind of Christ. And that's what I want to share on Sunday. He's like, oh, that's amazing. And then if you guys were here last Sunday, Dave preached on the mind as well and talked about how science is just catching up to what the Bible already says is true. The, the Bible has already declared science, you know, like God created it, and he gave this awesome word, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, Lord, what are you orchestrating here? Because, like, the three of us, all without even talking to each other, all got the same heart from the Lord, from the Holy Spirit, to speak on the mind. And I've been so passionate about the mind of Christ. When I came to the Lord, I came to the Lord when I was 21, and there was a lot of junk that the Holy Spirit had to filter through me. He had to rewire so much of my brain, my mind, to see him rightly, to see him for who he is. And I found that when I see the Lord rightly, when I start to understand who he is and what he's done for me, the things of this world just lay to the side. That my life is hidden in him, that he calls me a son, that I've been reconciled to him, and that there's freedom and authority in his name. That sin has no hold on me anymore. There's these truths that when you grab hold of them, you start to realize what it means to be a son, what it means to be a daughter, what it means to walk out in authority that Christ gave you. That I'm not a victim of the things of this world, that the things and giants and mountains that come into my life, God says I've given you authority over that. So today I want to be talking about the carnal mind compared to the mind of Christ. The carnal mind, which is really just a, a way of saying the, 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 the thought patterns of this world, the way this world operates, compared to how the mind of Christ operates, compared to the kingdom of God. Jesus preached for us to pray, your kingdom come, 
on earth as it is in heaven. And so there's this mandate from God to have us walk in this authority. And I believe that we can only do this when we have our minds fixated on the ones who set us free, on the one who set us free. There's this quote, when I, when I was 21, I went down to DTS, YWAM, if you're familiar with that, and I was not a believer. That's another story of how I even ended up there. I was depressed. I needed something in my life, and my dad pretty much was like, you should go do this, and I said, okay. And there was this, this poster on the wall, and it said this, and you guys may have heard this before. It says, watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. That becomes your life. And watch your life. That becomes your destiny. And that stuck with me. And, and it stuck with me today of, like, watch my thoughts. What am I doing with my thoughts? Where are my thoughts going? What's going on in my life right now that's causing me to do this or that? Am I fixated on the one who set me free? And when I'm, I believe that when we fixate our eyes and mind on the one who set us free, that's where we're going to see change happen in this place. That's where we're going to see Bellingham come alive. Like, guys, this is the promised land up here. You know what I'm saying? Like, I thought I've grown up in the Northwest my whole life. And I always knew Bellingham was awesome, but I never knew how awesome it was, right? Like, this place is amazing, and it's a promised land, and there's some giants in here, and uh, we get to take those giants out. We get to, by the love of God, say, no more sin. You will, have not, you will not take your place in stronghold in this place. We'll tear down those strongholds by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. So today, I'm going to be reading... Um, I'm going to be reading a passage of Joshua. And I was reading this uh, a few weeks back, and there's just this one passage, this one actually word that the Holy Spirit revealed to me that really set up this whole thing for for today. So we're going to be in Joshua, starting in chapter 5, verse 13, and we're going to go to Joshua chapter 6, verse 5. So it says this, when Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or foe? Neither. He replied, I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I'm at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. Starting in verse 1, chapter 6. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in, but the Lord said to Joshua, I've given you Jericho, its king, and all of its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times, with the priests blowing their horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse, and the people can charge straight into the town. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here with us. Come and consume this room. We say no spirit, but the Holy Spirit is allowed here. So fear, anxiety, depression, doubt, get out in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we give you this entire room. We don't just make a little room for you. We give it all to you. We say come and speak, Lord. Your servants are, speak, are, are listening. Speak to us, Lord. Bring freedom in this place and minister to your sons and daughters. Everyone said, amen. Amen. So before this happens, where Joshua has this peculiar encounter with the angel, I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about who Joshua is and really focus in on a key things that I find very important to understand of what's going on in Joshua, of who he is, of where his mind is at, where his heart is at, when he has this peculiar response from the angel uh, who says, neither, are you for for me or against me? Neither, he said. Joshua was an Israelite. He was with Moses. He was brought out of slavery. He wandered in the desert for 40 years. He saw God provide miraculously every day by feeding them manna, 
and, having, and, and drinking the water from the rock. He was with Moses when, or he was down with the people when Moses was up at Mount Sinai and they could look up and see the cloud of glory. Like he was with Moses. And, and most importantly is that he was known, when you read the first couple chapters of Joshua, he's known as a second Moses. And what's Moses known as? He's known as a friend of God. Moses had face-to-face encounters with God. And Joshua takes up really the the mantle of Moses to lead the people into the promised land. Moses wasn't able to do that. And Joshua is now ordained by God to say, you're going to lead my people into the promised land. The same way Moses split the Red Sea and led the Israelites out of slavery, so Joshua split the Jordan River and led the Israelites into the promised land. He was a man who loved God. And the most important thing that I, I want to share with you about Joshua is, is when Moses sends the spies into, he sends 12 spies into the promised land. They're in the desert wandering, and he needs some scouts to go out and, and, and give report of what's going on in the promised land. What is this land really all about? What's there? Come back with report and tell me what's going on. Ten of those spies come back. And they have a report that says, Moses, yeah, this land is flowing with milk and honey. It's an amazing land. It's kind of like Bellingham. But there's a problem. There's giants in the land. There's an enemy in the land. They've got fortified cities. There's no way we can take over this land. This was their report. There's no way. They they saw with their eyes what was in front of them, and they backed away and said, no way. They even went so far to say that we are but of grasshoppers in comparison to what's in front of us. They knew that God had called them to the promised land, and yet somehow they had this mindset of fear that when they saw the enemy in front of them, they cowered back and said, there's no way. It was a mindset. It was seeing things through the natural realm, through the worldly realm of what's in front of me. Their army is bigger than my army. They've got giants. I don't have any giants. They have fortified cities. We don't even have a city. And they cowered back in fear. Joshua and Caleb came with a different report. (laughs) Joshua came and said, yeah, this land is flowing with milk and honey. Yeah, there's fortified cities. Yeah, there's giants. Yeah, we have an enemy. But guess what? God is with us. God is for me. And he didn't even know it, but he was prophesying Romans 12, which says that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Nothing can stand against me. If God is for me, who can be against me? And he wasn't even a born-again Christian. He didn't even have the Holy Spirit. (laughs) And yet he knew his victory was in God. He knew that this town stood no chance because God was for him. And so Joshua, they, they get into the city of Gilgal, and, and the Lord says, consecrate yourselves. Set yourselves apart. So the Israelites set themselves apart and, and consecrated themselves to the Lord before entry into the promised land. It was the first requirement that God gave them before going in. Consecrate yourself. Set yourselves apart. You are a holy people, a chosen race. Set yourselves apart because you are mine and you are marked by me. We are not to look like this world. <laughs> As Christians, we are not to look and behave according to the patterns of this world. We are to be, behave as kingdom-minded sons and daughters. And it's an amazing invitation for us to come in. And so Joshua, he, he, they, they consecrate themselves, and he is ready to fight. He's got his armies ready. He's going in, and all of a sudden he has this, this encounter with the angel. I can, the one thing that we know up until this point is that Joshua had no strategy on what to do once to get into the promised land. He wasn't told, he was just told to overtake it. He was just told, go, wait for me to tell you what to do. And I can only imagine that Joshua is ready to go. He's like, my God is for me. Let's take this place out. Let's go. And maybe you guys have been in a place before where maybe God's called you somewhere. Maybe, maybe you're in a place of waiting on the Lord and God is saying, would you seek me right now? Don't go ahead of me. Because what Joshua did, what, what the angel did, what God was doing to Joshua was revealing a mindset to him that needed to be changed when he told him neither. 
he needed to get a point across to Joshua that, th- that his way of thinking of how he was about to go about this was not correct. That he was focusing on the wrong thing. Because this battle was never Joshua's. It's never his. As excited as he was, as ready as he was to go, this battle wasn't his. The Lord said, this is my battle. I need you to partner with me, Joshua. I need to give you strategy into what's going to happen right here. And maybe some of you guys, I know I'm guilty of this, have been in a place where God's called you somewhere and you're waiting and you're excited for what's about to happen and you get there and you're like, okay, now what? Right? Like, now now, now what do I do? And the natural instinct, the human instinct is to say, the worldly instinct is to say, okay, I'm just going to go about this and put it on my, uh, the weight on my shoulders to go do this now. The Israelites did this. A great example is when the Israelites are waiting for Moses to come down with the Ten Commandments. And what do they do? They build a calf. They, they get impatient. They're waiting God said, wait for me. Guys, they can see the fire of God. They're eating manna that's supernaturally being provided for them, and they get impatient. (sighs) Yeah, it's crazy. And yet we do it all the time. And yet we just decide to put the weight on our shoulders and say, thanks, God, I got this from here. Where, Where God is telling Joshua, I need you to change the way you think. It's actually the word for repentance, which is metanoia. I need you to change the way you think. You're not going to see the kingdom of God if you don't change the way you think. Because the way you think is inevitably, without the Holy Spirit, is going to be drawn to the custom and patterns of this world. But repentance is the most amazing, beautiful gift that the Lord comes. And when we repent, and we say, Lord, I'm not seeing you rightly. We just sung about it. To see you rightly, Lord, just as you are. I want to see you rightly. Because when I see him rightly, I know who he says I am. So God was confronting Joshua, saying that this is not your battle. This is mine. Listen up. I'm going to give you strategy. So the carnal mind can't see the kingdom of God, and there's a few distractions that bring about the, 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 the thought patterns of this world. There's a few distractions that come up. Not all of them are found just in this passage right here, but one of them, that the first thing that I noticed that Joshua did was he didn't recognize the angel. Busyness can be a distraction of setting your mind on, on, king, on the kingdom, on the mind of Christ, on, on Jesus. Busyness can say, I've got this. I'm go, 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 go. I'm ready to fight. You know, when Joshua was in that, in that place, I'm reminded of Peter who pulls his sword out and just cuts an ear off, and Jesus is like, put your sword away. This isn't your battle. And our busyness is a way for us to say, I've got this, God. If you guys want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Right? Tell God your plans. That'll make him laugh. James chapter 4, 13 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such, an, such a town, spend a year there, trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Guys, it's all about him. It's about him. And he will implant thoughts and strategy on your heart and mind. But unless if we go to him and say, God, what is your will here? We're going off on our own. And how many know this life, like, like James says right here, this life is but a mist. We're going to look back on so many things and be like, what vanity? What vanity was that that I was pursuing when I'm now face to face with the king? You guys, we get all of eternity to spend life with God and his kingdom, but we get one life to bring his kingdom to earth. And I have a feeling that we're going to look back and look at the things that were just all vanity 
that weren't for him, that really were just selfish desires of ours, of wanting to see things happen because of the thought patterns of this world that tell us this is what we're supposed to do. The, the second thing I put down here is idolatry um, as a distraction, as a distraction to the mind of Christ. Are you guys good? Are you guys with me? Okay. Guys, I get excited about the gospel, and if I'm like, I'm not preaching, I've been preaching to myself as I prepared this this whole week, all right, like, and this stuff gets me excited, okay? There, there, is, there is a vision that I had this week, <clears throat> and I was laying down, um, about to go to bed, and I lay my head down, close my eyes, and all of a sudden, I am like flying. I am up way above the stratosphere I am flying and all my senses are going off like this really feels like I'm flying right now and I open my eyes and I'm like okay I'm not sleeping <laughs> wasn't sure what was going on and I immediately knew I was like God's showing me something right now and I closed my eyes and sure enough I'm there and I'm flying <laughs> high above the earth and I said God what are you doing what are you trying to show me right now and all of a sudden I bump into this big brick wall and this wall was thick and it would stretch to eternity. I was like, whoa, this is a big wall, God. What's going on here? I noticed something that as I was on this one side of the wall, there's the other side of the wall. And on this one, on the side that I was currently on, there is this force that was sucking me up. It, like, I, it was just like, and I could see it like a vacuum, like bringing things up. And, um, and the Lord showed me this, is this, this side of the wall is the way of this world. Never knew how parched my throat would get here. Oh, you know a pet peeve of mine is when people will drink with a mic in their hand and you can hear it. It's like, ah, no, come on. <laughs> Just put the mic down, man. Put the mic down. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and it was like this, this one side of the wall was a vacuum. And it was just sucking things up into it. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. And I could feel it. The other side of this wall, there was peace. There was shalom. It was, it was righteousness. It was God's presence on the other side of this wall. And the Lord showed me that there is a lie that people are trying so hard to get to over this wall through the waves of this world, and they don't know that this wall is never ending. Maybe if I just bought one more house. Maybe if I just had that car, maybe if I just had that one more thing, it will bring me over to the other side that brings happiness, joy, and peace. I look down, and I see that the wall had started way above the earth. And the only way to get onto the other side of the wall was to go under. And the Lord told me, it takes work to get low. That God, he calls us to serve and it takes work to humble yourself and get low. But once you do, that's what brings you to the other side is the servant's heart. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his life. God is asking us, will you give your life for me? Because that's where you find shalom. That's where you find peace. That's where you'll find my kingdom. That this mindset of the world is sucking you up, and it's a lie that says that you are going to find peace, that you're going to find freedom from the things that it's lying to you about. Those things will never bring freedom. And God wants us to give that to him. Um, my, I, I was just like sitting down in our, at our dining room table, and I was just like praying and just like putting some stuff together here. This was earlier this week. And my wife, Sophie, comes, and she just like puts her hands on my back, and she just starts praying. And she's just praying for me, praying like against any spiritual warfare that's going on, praying for, you know, uh, the Lord to, to speak, all of that. And then we, it just turns into this holy moment where we're both just praying together. And, and my wife, Sophie, starts just praying and starts repenting of idolatry that's been in our life, this, I, this idol of comfort, this idol that says, I just need comfort in this life. I just need to be comfortable it's this lie that's sucking me up on the wrong side of the wall. And guys, repentance will, will bring you low. And we're just weeping as we're just like, Lord, we repent of this idol of comfort. Guys, 
Christians are not meant to be called to comfort. We are to be uncomfortable. We are like, imagine just being so dependent on the Holy Spirit where I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Where I don't even know, like, like that's a whole nother level. I remember, I, I, this, I, I wasn't planning on saying this, guys, but I remember a time when I was going through school. I was paying my way through college. I really wanted to get through debt free. I was doing it on my own, you know, and I was going to community college. I was working in the summer, and I remember I had gotten this tip. I think it was $40. I had gotten this $40 tip, and I was saving every penny I could to help make my way through school. It was summertime, so I was off, and I was working full time. And I remember as I get this tip, I'm driving, and I'm going straight to the bank. I'm like, God, Thank you for this money. I needed this. I needed this $40 so badly. And as I'm driving, it's like a 15, 20 minute drive from where I was at. As I'm driving, the Lord says, that's not yours. <laughs> Straight up. And I start fighting with him like, God, this is mine. I need this, Lord. And I just keep hearing him, that soft, gentle voice. It's not yours. And I said, Okay, God, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. <laughs> serious. I'm serious. I said, I'm headed to the bank right now. If you show me who to give this to, fine. But if not, it's going in the bank. <laughs> I'm driving. I'm like almost there. It's like one block away. I'm like, oh, I'm, get, I'm making it. <laughs> I've got this. This is my money. And all of a sudden, I see this lady waiting at a bus stop. And I don't know if you guys have ever, ever had someone highlighted to you where they just explode with, like, light. You just see them, and God's like, boop. Like, you know. Your spirit man is like, yeah, they're highlighted. Not physically, but your spirit man sees it. Your spiritual eyes see it. We were talking about the spiritual realm. There was a spiritual realm, and that's what saw this lady highlighted. And I go up to her, I pull over, and I, you know, it went from reluctancy to all of a sudden excitement. Because the Lord highlighted it. It was like, okay, Lord, you actually are behind this. If it would have been me, just like, here you go. No, the Lord's like, keep your money. But the Lord highlighted this, this woman, and, and it made me excited of all of a sudden, like, oh, I get to partner with God right now. I get to partner with him. Let's do this, God. And I go, I pull over, and I run up to her. I'm like, excuse me. And I start to share with her how God has told me that this money wasn't for me and that it was supposed to be given to someone. And I tell her how God highlighted her to me and that God has a gift for her. And I just like, and I pray for her and I give her the money and she's just crying. And she, she pulls out her wallet from her purse and opens it up and it's like, there's pennies in it. She's like, this is all that's left to my name. And I just got to bless her with that. Like, our way, guys, our way of comfort, our way of thinking is so outside the way the Lord wants to move. And when we lay that down, when we surrender that to God, talk about a Holy Spirit adventure of getting to hear him, of getting to partner with him, of getting to be his hands and feet. Idolatry. Yeah, I, I think today in our world, there's such a lie of this comfort. There is such a lie of having and needing more to get to that place. And that, that, that gift of repentance and the way God gave his life. And, and so now we get, to be, we get to replicate that, I think, is one of the most beautiful things we get to do as Christians. The last thing that I put for something that separates us, and it's quite apparent is sin, right? Sin, sin will separate you real fast from, in, in your mind, from, from God's kingdom. Now, now don't mistake what I'm saying here. Colossians, this is just coming to me right now, Colossians 3 or Colossians 2 says that you are enemies with God in your own mind. You know, God actually loves you. God loves me. And yet, when our minds are fixated on the things of this world, we can all of a sudden, in our shame, like Adam and Eve, hide. God was looking for Adam and Eve, saying, where, where are you guys at? He knew. But they're hiding in shame because in their minds, they're all of a sudden enemies to God. 
Let's see, I think I wrote something down here on this. Yeah, this is good. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you there longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That sin, man, God has called us holy. He says that our sin nature has been crucified to the cross. He says that that sin that tries to entangle you, there is freedom from that. And that by the Holy Spirit, we get to live a life of freedom from it. Uh, it's powerful. But so is sin when we give into it, that slowly but surely it starts to wrap us up and take us deeper than we ever thought we'd want to go. I remember when I was like, I, I, I was born in a Christian family, but when my parents divorced, I said, I want nothing to do with this. And smoking weed ended up to drinking, ended up to sex, ended up to ecstasy, cocaine, all the drugs. I all of a sudden found myself deeper than a place that I ever wanted to be. Just one thing, one, one compromise at a time. I said, God, I forget you. I don't want this. I see the hypocrisy in your church. I see the hypocrisy that happened to my family. Like, I don't want this. This is, this is garbage. And it led me down a path until when I was 21 of seeing God rightly. And it's a journey forevermore, guys. Don't get me wrong. Like, God is so good and he's so infinite that if we could discover all of who God is, I'd say he's a, probably a pretty finite God. And it's this journey of us getting to uncover who he is for the rest of our lives. Forevermore, we are seeking after him. We are, we are discovering more of his nature, of his goodness. Paul says, I have not yet arrived, but I race on towards the prize. I race with all my heart towards the prize, and that is Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> One of the first things I, I noticed that the angel told Joshua was to, get on, was to take off your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. And it's a very similar request that God made of Moses before Moses was anointed and called to go deliver the Israelites. Guys, there is a fear of the Lord that postures ourselves to hear from God. There is a fear of God that before the Lord gave any strategy to Joshua about how to take down the walls of Jericho, he needed him to posture himself in this place of God. Like, I need that healthy fear of the Lord. And, and fear of the Lord, guys, isn't this place of being afraid of God. It's not a place where you're scared that he's going to smite you, where you're scared of him, where you think that he's going to bring bad things on you. If you're here and you think that God did something to, to put sickness on you or to take something, someone away from you, like, like death, that's not from God. That's not his kingdom. He came to bring life. He healed the sick. And, and what does Jesus say about uh, the devil? He says, a kingdom divided against itself will never stand. How could God come and, and take your baby away from you and be good? How can he come and, you know, we have so many ways of thinking that say, like, he, he, he put the sickness in me. Like, God came and healed sickness. He healed everyone he touched. A kingdom divided against itself will never stand. The way we view God will dictate the way we follow him. It'll dictate our actions. If I view God as scary, as up there and just waiting for me to mess up, man, my life is not going to be that life of freedom that he promises. If I'm scared that he's going to put sickness in me if I mess up ever, or if I am sick and I'm like, oh, was it? Uh, no, guys, God is good. And God is love. And there, the, you, we will never be able to operate in the fullness and the freedom that God has given us if that is our mentality of who God is, if that is our thought life of who God is. A fear of the Lord says, God, you are holy. You are good. I bow before you because my life is yours. Everything I have is yours, Lord. You are so worthy and so deserving of it. And nothing less. 
That is this fear of God that in his presence, you bow before him. You say, what will you have your servant do? That was Joshua's response. What will you have your servant do? Um, I'm going to invite the band to come back up. John 15, 15 says this. It says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. The sad thing is, is I see a lot of Christians that are, don't know that they're friends of God. There's a lot of servants, but not a lot of friends. I believe God wants to say, come and be, be my friend today. Like God's saying, like, I want friendship with you. I want to be with you. It says that a friend knows the will of his master. A servant doesn't. A servant's just told to do. A friend comes and, and communicates. It says, what's going on here? Moses was known as a friend of God. And Moses actually changed God's mind when God said, I'm going to go and wipe out the Israelites when this idol was made. He said, I'm going to go and take these guys out. I'm sick of this. And Moses said, wait a second. What about your word? What about your promise? What about who you say we are as your chosen people? And I believe God was inviting Moses into this dialogue with him. That he wanted Moses to approach him as a friend. He wanted, God knew. Guys, God, we know like God is for Joshua, right? Like we know that when, when the angel replied, neither are you for me or against me, we know throughout the story that God was for Joshua. It was the thinking that needed to be changed. And same with Moses. God was just saying, Moses, come and approach me. Come and be with me. Like he wants that. He yearns for that. He, he yearns for friendship so we can now have this relationship with God that he's invited us into all along that says, come and be my friend. Come, come be like John who laid at the, on the chest of Jesus and heard him whispering into his ear. Peter didn't know what John, Peter didn't know what Jesus was saying and he had to go to John. If you guys are familiar with the story, John's laying back, it's at the Last Supper. He's laying back on Jesus' uh, bosom, his chest. And Peter, like, he leans over into John's ear. He's like, what's Jesus saying? John knew what Jesus was saying because he was in a place of intimacy with God. He was in a place where he could just recline on Jesus' chest and be, get whispered into his ear of the things of the thoughts of God. So at, I want to go back into Yeshua, if that's okay. Um, I don't know if that's what chord you guys are in or not, but all right, cool. Um, but... As we close, this is what I felt the Lord saying for today. The end of the, st the story of Joshua ends up with God giving strategy to Joshua on how to take down the walls of Jericho. He gives him strategy that had nothing to do with his own strength. And I believe God wants to give his bride strategy into, into our hearts and minds here today. I believe that we need it. I believe that without this strategy, guys, Bellingham will stay the same. But I also believe God is for us, that he's with us, and that he has a plan for Bellingham, that Bellingham will be transformed and changed by the love of God. And he's going to give a strategy on how to bring that here to Bellingham. I'm reminded... I'm reminded of David, who, before he ever killed a giant in front, in the public, he was in private killing lions and bears. That there was a place where David was being formed, where he was understanding what it means to be a warrior, that before any public annihilation of the enemy he was he was killing bears and this is what that means is that there is a place where in the secret place God wants to find and meet you there he wants to find and meet you in a place where it's just you with him 
where you approach him, whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it is, guys, we don't have to overcomplicate it. He's just, he wants to draw us into the secret place with him. A place that says, Lord, it's just me and you. What do you want to say? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And you'll find, you'll, he'll give you strategy and show you how to kill the lions and the bears. It's practice. It's practice. And there are giants in this land. There are enemies. There are fortified cities. But guess what? God has given us strategy on how to overtake it. 